had the privilege of sharing with you last week. Um, and uh, <laughs> I know in the lead up to that, um, that message, it was a blessing for me in the study that I did. And hopefully <laughs> it was a blessing to you. I know we kind of, we dealt with some like real kind of hard ground last week, but hopefully you were blessed for it. And the encouragement from Bishop was to go away and study um, Mark chapter 7. And hopefully you did that and have maybe even looked into some of the things that we were talking about last week. Um, but we spent a lot of time last week talking about the uh, intertestamental period. So the bit, the, the, the period of 400 years that we say is the time of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament where it was said that there was no recorded or no major word from the Lord um, to the people of Israel. But we saw that in that period, lots of things, lots of different things happened to the point where we come into the New Testament and there are some things that we haven't seen before. We see the emergence of rabbis and synagogues and Pharisees and Sadducees um, and many more things um, we see in the New Testament that we didn't see in the Old Testament. But the crux of the text last week, the beginning of Mark um, chapter 7, was that we are not made unrighteous or unholy by the things that enter in us from outside, but rather those things that come from the inside out. Kind of ties in a little bit with the book of James where it says, let no man say when he sins that he is tempted by God. Um, but it's when we're drawn away by our own lust, there is something that's within us that latches onto or connects with that which is outside of us in order to draw us away from God or draw us into things that displease God. But I thank God that Jesus has come to change us from the inside out. Amen. He's come to change us from the inside out, not the outside in. And sometimes we kind of, we get it twisted in church because we can be so focused on the outside, the modification of people's behavior or people's appearance or you know the words that you say or whatever it is you know Jesus didn't call us to make converts but he called us to make disciples and if we look at Jesus' disciples these were 12 men of just just different guys rugged <laughs> they had some um they had some harsh edges on them they were they were diamonds in the rough and three years Jesus spent with them, teaching them, demonstrating to them, loving on them, walking alongside them. And he called them his friends. He called them his friends. Knowing that it wasn't their righteousness that they would have to rely on. But it was his righteousness that they would have to put their full trust and assurance in. Sometimes I look at the disciples and I think up until the point where Jesus was about to be crucified Peter was still still had an issue with his mouth still had an issue with his anger still had an issue with his shank I mean he was still willing to pull out a knife and cut off someone's ear yet Jesus said Peter <laughs> on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. He said, it was Peter that he said to, the devil's come to, sh to sift you and to try you, to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you. <laughs> and he said, when you are restored, when you are strengthened, go and strengthen the brethren. See, God doesn't look at us where we are, but God is not even, his faith isn't even in us, but his faith is in him. That he is able to transition us and to perfect us and to, to, to bring us into the place and into the people that he has created us to be. So our, our, our religious observance and our outward displays of righteousness aren't God's main concern.
but it's a transformation of our hearts internally that God is most concerned with. And you know, we, we, we live in a day and age where we struggle with the word religion. And many of us will say, well, someone says, oh, you're religious, aren't you? No, I'm not religious. I'm a follower of Jesus. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not religious. I, I have a faith. But you know, religion isn't a bad thing. Religion, it speaks of devotion. It speaks of dedication. It speaks of discipline. And there is an element to religion that is routine. But routine is good. Routine is good within its, but it has its boundaries. So routine is good, but it's not all there, all there is. Amen? I think it was last year that we were looking at the book of James. And, um, James chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, if we could, if we could have that up. James chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 says, If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, the person's religion is worthless. Verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Let's go back to verse 26. In this passage, when James talks about religion, there are two words in the Greek that he uses. So there's threskia. Can you say that? Threskia? And threskos. Threskos. So threskia is uh, external worship. It concerns ceremony and maybe what ritual religious discipline it looks at that and threskos is it means to, to fear God our, our fear of God or our worship of God it, it literally means to tremble to tremble or be fearful so in verse 26 James says that if our threskos our fear of God or our outward fear of God if anyone thinks he is threskos, he is God-fearing, and does not bridle his tongue, that's really basic, does not bridle his tongue, doesn't keep his mouth in check, but deceives his heart, this person's external observations and external rituals, this person's threskia, <laughs> is worthless. So if you think you're God-fearing, but you're not able to do some simple things like bridle your tongue, then all your religious observance is useless. That's what, that's what James is saying. <laughs> Jesus is so concerned with the heart. And now we're going we're gonna to look at our text. So I'll keep that in mind. And now we're going to look at our text. Mark chapter 7. And I'm going to deal primarily with verse 24 to verse 30. And we'll see if I get past that to the last few verses. And it says, And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know. Yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him, came down and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first. For it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. <laughs> but she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Whenever I used to read this scripture, I used to be so shocked at Jesus' response to the woman. 
it is such a burn. It seems so harsh. Why would Jesus respond to this woman who, she's not asking him for money. She's not asking him for some kind of status. She's not asking him for anything material. Her, her daughter has an issue with a demon. So this is a spiritual matter that she's come to Jesus about. She, she's not come for a physical healing. She's not come for a material issue, but she's come to Jesus for a spiritual issue. And if you have a spiritual issue, if you have a physical issue, it would make sense to go to your doctor. Yeah? If you had a financial issue, it would make sense maybe to go to your bank manager or your financial advisor. But if you have a spiritual issue, where can you turn except to Jesus? But Jesus answers her and said, let the children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. It's deep. <laughs> it sounds deep. It sounds like a deep burn. But we're going to just explore this a little bit. So the Bible says that Jesus, he went away and he went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now Tyre and Sidon is is a it's a place that kind of it's a name that comes up quite readily and regularly in Scripture. Tyre and Sidon was Gentile territory, so Jesus had been you know he'd been he'd been he'd been advocating he'd been doing his ministry, and the fame of Jesus was was getting bigger and bigger. And we know in the previous chapter, he's just fed the 5,000 men and women and children added to that. So the fame of Jesus is, is becoming greatly known. But Jesus retires to a place, a Gentile place. So he's greatly known, but probably mainly amongst the Jews, mainly amongst those of Israel. Amen. <laughs> but he goes away to this place called Tyre and Sidon. Now Tyre and Sidon was Gentile territory. Not only was it Gentile territory, but it was the area from which the worst, most demon-worshipping queen of Israel came from, Jezebel. Jezebel was from, Tyre, from the region of Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon was the place where Baal worship originated. In Ezekiel 28, Ezekiel talks about the king of Tyre. And at first we think, okay, he's talking about this king. But then he begins to say that you were in Eden and you walked behind God in heaven. And it, and it becomes clear that he's not talking about uh, an earthly king, but he's talking about Satan. And he's talking about the fall of Satan. So Tyre is equated with the seat of Satan. Are you, are you with me? So this place where Jesus was, it wasn't a, it wasn't a godly place. It wasn't a place where, you know, people were freely worshipping, um, Yahweh. But this was a place that was known for its, its idol worship. Not only that, but the territory had been taken over by Rome. So you had, you had idol worship of Baal or Ashtara. And then you had the Greek worshiping whatever gods they worshiped. And you had, it, it was under Roman rule as well. So remember last week I spoke about the Sadducees, how they had become Hellenized and they aligned themselves with the powers of the day just so life was a little bit easier for them. We, we're going somewhere. Stay with me. <laughs> okay. So this is where Jesus was. And the Bible says that this woman was a Syrophoenician woman. So Syrophoenicia wasn't even a place. But the writer kind of makes a point of saying 
that this woman was a Phoenician woman, but not only a Phoenician woman, but he put the Syrah at the start of it, and that is to emphasize that she was from, she was also from Syria. So we know also that the Syrians had some issues with the, with the children of Israel, with the Jews. In Matthew, it calls her a Canaanite woman. So not only was, we, have we got all this going on, but we know that the Canaanites should have been totally wiped out. They shouldn't even have existed by this time. So this is the woman that Jesus was talking to, not just a Gentile, but you could say, like, as, as Paul said, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. This was a Gentile of Gentiles. This was kind of the most ungodly, she, she was from the most ungodly place and region and circumstance that anyone could have ever come from. But yet she'd heard about Jesus. So what's interesting is that in chapter 6, when Jesus feeds the multitude, it says that there were people there from Tyre and Sidon also, isn't it, Hashanah? So not only had Jesus' name just been kind of made famous amongst the Jews, but it, was, it had become famous even amongst the Gentiles. But we know that Jesus' mission was to the Jews. In Matthew 15 verse 24, Jesus said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus had a mission, Jesus had a mandate, and Jesus was focused on his mission and his mandate. Amen? Amen. But yet he comes into contact with this woman. And it's interesting that it's, that it's here after what we spoke about last week. We spoke about religion. And we spoke about religious observances. But now Jesus is almost, the way that this is written is that Jesus is almost put in a situation where his own hang-ups and his own cultural differences are kind of put on the stand. And it's like, well, what is Jesus going to do here? What is Jesus going to do here? So the woman, as I said, it's not, a, it's not a physical issue that she has. It's not a financial issue that she has. But it's a spiritual issue that she has. And it's not even her that she's coming to Jesus for. But she's coming to Jesus for her daughter. And Jesus answers, let the children be fed first. For it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Sounds so harsh. What's Jesus going to do here? So the first response of Jesus is in line with his culture. or Because we know Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. Still a Jewish man. Still living in Jewish culture. Still having been brought up according to Jewish customs. But we saw last week that Jesus isn't bound by these customs. He isn't bound by this structure. But now we kind of see him put against something that kind of would really put that to the test. And his response is how you would expect a Jewish man to respond to a woman who was not only a Gentile, but the worst kind of Gentile that there could possibly be. But he says, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the ducks. Jesus' mission is to the lost sheep of Israel. But we can look at that and we can just see that, ouch, Jesus, that's harsh. But actually what Jesus was saying was a factual statement. He was saying that first... I'm coming to Israel. But this woman must have known something about Jesus. I know that your mission is to Israel. I know that your mission is to the children of Israel. But I know that the king that is coming is not just the king of Israel. The saviour that is coming is not just the saviour of Israel. But he is the saviour of the whole world. 
So the woman then answers him and says, Lord, but even the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. So Jesus, I know that you've come for Israel. I know that you've come with a focus and I know that you've come with a purpose. But God, I know also that you are the God of abundance. And God, you don't just, you don't just provide just about enough. You provide more than enough. And even when the children have eaten, there have got to be some crumbs. There have got to be, there's got to be something left for the rest of us. Because I know that you're not just the savior of Israel. You're not just the savior of the Jews, but you're the savior of the whole world. And then Jesus says, for this statement, you may go your way and the demon has left your daughter. <laughs> it's interesting that when Jesus fed the multitude with the two fish and the five loaves, that after they had collected all the leftovers, there were still 12 baskets. There were still 12 baskets, 12 representing the apostles, 12 representing the tribes of Israel. But once Israel has eaten, there is still enough for the rest of the world. The crumbs are not just measly crumbs and morsels, but the crumbs are enough. Because if he started with five loaves and two fish and ended with 12 baskets full, then surely there's more than enough for me and for you to eat from the table of the Lord. It was the faith of the woman and the tenacity of the woman. Notice how she wasn't offended by what Jesus said. Sometimes we need to learn how not to be offended. <laughs> Sometimes when you're going after something, you've got to learn how not to be offended. In fact, you have to build up a wall because offense is, it literally means to build up a wall. But sometimes you've got to build up a wall against offense itself. Then I'm not going to be offended when that person who I'm trying to win for Jesus, that person who I'm discipling and walking alongside says something that, 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 that might, <laughs> that might come against my personal belief. Because our job is not to create converts, but it's to create disciples. Disciples walk with people. They walk alongside people. But if you are a disciple, You've got to learn how not to be offended. <laughs> when Jesus turned around to Peter, and Peter says, Jesus, you don't, you're not going to have to go to the cross. You're not going to have, have to do all of that kind of stuff. And he says, get thee behind me, Satan. What kind of mindset would Peter have had to have to continue following Jesus? It was a mindset that said... <laughs> Just a, just a few verses earlier, Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter, but it is God that has revealed this to you. And on this rock, I will build my church. And just a few verses later, Jesus is rebuking Peter and saying, get thee behind me, Satan. But Peter had to have an understanding not to be offended. When the, when the multitude turned away from Jesus because he says, if you really want to follow me, you're going to have to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And many turned away and said, this is a hard saying. Who can do it? And from that moment, many turned away from him and followed him no more. And Jesus turns to the disciples and says, are you also going to walk away? And it's Peter that says, Lord, where else shall we go? Who else has the words of eternal life when I am looking for something that is greater than myself I don't have to worry about being offended I don't have to worry about what obstacles are placed in my way I don't worry about what he said or she said but I've just got to get what I need to get from Jesus because the doctor can't help me the financial advisor can't help me nobody in my region or my situation can help me but Jesus if anyone can help me you can do it so sometimes I have to go through some hardship in order to get what I need from you and I guess that's a little bit like the religion that God expects us to have 
<laughs> sometimes, church, I don't know about you, but sometimes praying isn't easy. Sometimes reading my Bible every day isn't easy. Sometimes it feels like the heaviest book to pick up. Or for you young people, sometimes it feels like the hardest app to open. Fasting isn't easy. But I wonder, I wonder if there are those of us in here that realize the need that we have cannot be satisfied by anything else. It can't be satisfied by anything else. So God, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do it. Whatever discipline that I need to put myself under, I, I'm going to do it. Whatever, whatever thing that you ask of me, I'm going to do it. And I'm making a decision in my mind not to be offended and not to be easily dissuaded. Because what I want from you, I can't get from anywhere else. So God, help me to have the spirit and the tenacity of the Syrophoenician woman. That even when I hear something that seems offensive, even when I hear something that seems like a hard saying, would I pursue you with a tenacity that says, God, I know it's hard, but I know you got some crumbs. God, I know it's hard, but I, I, I know you got some leftovers. And your leftovers are better than the starters and the main meal and the third and the fourth and the fifth course at any five-star restaurant. Jesus, I need you. <laughs> the whole thing about religion, it's not just about getting something from God. And this is where every, every parable that becomes a splitting point where it works really well and explains a spiritual thing really well up until a point. But then when you're dealing with the spiritual, sometimes nothing physical can really explain what it is. We've got this woman who needed something from God and her need was spiritual. But actually, she really wanted him. What she needed was him. Because I know if I get you, Jesus, if I seek first the kingdom of God, then everything else is going to be sorted. I know, Jesus, if I, if I seek after you, that every other issue, every other thing in my life you're going to sort out. And it might not look like I think it's going to look like. And it might not change in the way that I think it's going to change. But God, even if you don't change my situation, I know that you can change me. See, the whole thing about us reading and us praying and us fasting is not so much about God changing our situations, but it's about God changing us we want peace in our city but it's going to take for some people to see the churches coming together and coming out of the four walls and walking down the roads of Heath Town and walking down Chester Street and walking down Leicester Street and walking down all kinds of whatever we call ghetto in Wolverhampton walking down some of those places and saying we're here not just because we got something from God, but because we got to God and we were changed and transformed. <laughs> and the thing about when God changes and transforms us, we don't just walk away with our bellies full, <laughs> but we walk away with baskets full. So not only is my need met, 
but I'm, I'm carrying something that is able to meet the need of someone else. I'm, I'm carrying something that is able to feed someone else. I'm, I'm carrying something that is able to set free something else because I'm not just carrying my blessing. I'm not just carrying my portion, but I'm walking with Jesus. Jesus, the one who is able to bind up broken hearts. Jesus, the one who is able to set captives free. Jesus, the one who is able to break chains. Jesus, the one who is able to restore confused minds. I'm not just walking with my little miracle in my pocket, but I'm walking with Jesus with me that everywhere I go, when I walk into the workplace, I'm bringing Jesus with me. When I'm when I'm walking into my house and I'm dealing with my children, I'm bringing Jesus with me. And the thing about Jesus with me means that even though I don't see a change in the situation, I know that I will not be easily offended. I've I've built up a a thing in my heart where I will not be easily dissuaded. So I'm going to keep walking. I'm going to keep moving with him. I'm going to keep running with him because I know that if I keep running with him, if I keep sticking to him, if I keep going to him, even if it's when I'm on my deathbed, even if it's beyond my lifespan, there's going to be change. (laughs) the psalmist said it's been a long time coming not the psalmist (laughs) but a change gonna come I wonder if God is calling us to renew our understanding of what religion is I wonder if God is calling us to a place where really get to understand these spiritual disciplines in a different way. That the spiritual disciplines aren't a thing of which we kind of think, okay, this makes me right standing with God. But actually, these spiritual disciplines and these spiritual things that we do, they help me to see God more clearly. Jesus says, to the, to the scribes and the Pharisees, you, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have life. But what you didn't know is that the scriptures were speaking of me. You can search the scriptures all you want, but unless your heart is to get to know him, is to get to know him. I'm not just doing it for the sake of doing it. I'm not just doing it because it's the right thing to do. I'm not just doing it because it makes me righteous. Because he has made me righteous. He has covered me. He has perfected me forever. Already. But in my devotion, I begin to see him more clearly. That my devotion doesn't become something that shackles me, but it becomes something that frees me. It becomes something that liberates me. Jesus says, don't think I've come to do away with the law and all of the prophets. I've come to fulfill it. So whatever we see Jesus doing, that's what the law was really pointing to. But when you look at the law just in the letters, it looks like bondage. But when the Spirit of God works on our hearts and we look at the law, it begins to look like Jesus. And Jesus is freedom. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. But we have issues and concerns about our righteousness. And we have things that trouble our minds and disturb our peace. And we live in a way that limits, or we think in a way that limits and constrains our joy. But Jesus says, that's not me. He says, it's the devil that comes to steal and to kill and to destroy but I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly these things aren't restraining but they are liberating that's why 
Jesus was able to go to a Gentile place and deal with the issue of a Gentile woman, even though it was outside the focus of his mission, because his mission wasn't, it, it wasn't so tied to his mission that he couldn't be free to operate in love and compassion and mercy, because that's who he is. That's who he is. He is a God of grace. He is a God of love. He is a God of justice. He is a God of righteousness. He is a God of truth. He chastises those who he loves. But he is a God of liberty. He is a God of abundance. He is a God of freedom. And I wonder, church, if because of our traditions, I wonder if because of some of our man-made legislations that we are living below the standard of which God wants us to live and we're constrained to say, I can't do this and I can't do that and I can't talk to that person and I can't talk to that. But not knowing that Jesus is dwelling inside of you I guess this is a kind of seller moment. It's a kind of stop and think moment. And at the end of the end of last week's service, I spoke about what are those things inside of us that God is wanting to deal with, because it's the things that come from the inside out that defile us. But I wonder if God is bringing us to a place where He's saying, "What is it that I have given you?" that you're not accessing. There's an abundance. <laughs> then there's, there's an abundance on the table. And because we only started off with two fish and five loaves, you're just, you're just taking just that little bit to ensure that the miracle can happen. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, God doesn't need our help for the miracle to happen. <laughs> God has already made provision <laughs> before he even turned around to his disciples and said what can we get for these people to eat he'd already made provision there's a thing that happened when Jesus took the bread and the fish and it says that he took the bread and he blessed it and one of the um, one of the meanings of that word bless is to make adequate and we'll sing songs like, I am blessed. Every day of my life, I am blessed. When I wake up in the morning and when I lay my head to rest, I am blessed. But you still feel inadequate. Still feel like I'm not doing enough. Not praying enough. Not, and this isn't, this isn't hyper grace. This isn't, I'm not saying to do away with that, but I'm saying God wants to change our heart. So the motive of our why is different. I'm not doing it to become more holy. I'm not doing it for, for God to, for me to be acceptable to God because he's already made me adequate. But the reason why we do these things is that we can see him more clearly. So what God has already laid hold of for me, I'm able to access and I'm able to walk in it. God has given us abundant life to walk in. And because of some of our constraints and some of the things in our mind and some of our traditions, we're, we're not accessing it. We're not accessing it. And the thing is, God's got enough for you. <laughs> He's got enough for the vilest of sinners. He's got enough for your family. There is enough. And God says, I have blessed you. I have made you adequate. The woman's caught in the act of adultery. The people pick up their stones to stone her. Jesus writes on the ground. And he says, He's, he is without sin. Throw the first stone. And slowly, each of them drop their stones and they begin to walk away. So it's just Jesus and the woman left. And Jesus says to the woman, woman, where are your accusers? Church. Jesus is saying, where are your accusers? The accuser of the brethren, I have silenced him 
and made a public show that he is defeated. Where are your accusers? Then now go and sin no more. Now go and walk in the fullness of life that I have that I have won for you. Now go and walk in the abundance of life that I have given to you. You don't have to walk in this condemnation anymore. And no matter what anyone else wants to say, they know the reason why they dropped their stone. Satan knows the reason why he had to let you go. Because Jesus came and set you free and made you adequate. He took off the filthy robes and placed on you robes of righteousness and said, you are mine. You are in the palm of my hand and no one and nothing can pluck you out. It's his goodness that leads us to repentance. Jesus said, because of what I've done for you, let your devotion flow out of what I've done for you. Not because of what you can do for me. Time's gone. And I don't know if this is an altar call message. And maybe it is an altar call message. And maybe you've been hearing the words, the mishmash words of this guy. And somehow the Holy Spirit has begun tugging on your heart. And you know, I want this Jesus... I want this freeness. I want this abundance of life. I want this. I need this. And you know what? I'm going to be like the Syrophoenician woman. And I don't care who's looking. I don't care how long I've been coming here. I don't care who wants to think what about me. But the thing that I need, only Jesus can give it to me. And if that's you, I just want to pray with you. All I want to do. I just want to pray with you. So I'm going to ask you just to meet me here at the front. Just meet me here at the front if that's you. And if it's not, if there's nobody in here that that that, that call is for, I know that God was speaking today. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord.